It's the most beautiful time of the year. Lights fill the lab, there's so much beer. I should be playing in the winter snow. But I'ma be watching Mr. Lawrence with you, with you. Henrik with you, with you. Okay, I'm stopping. The Flick Lab, vieläkö kuuluu? Tämä on hienoa. And of course the, the techniques break up just at the most convenient moments. Of course I was giving you a... Heartfelt Christmas song there, Henrik, but the connection uh, disconnected at that particular moment. I, I was saved by the gods of shitty internet connections. <laughs> anyway, once again, welcome to the Flick Lab and Merry Kurisumazu. <laughs> this is the Furikulabu. Hi. Yeah, so yeah, welcome to the great. Christmas special episode of the Flick Lab. Yes, e- except for the ones that do not want to celebrate Christmas with us. And uh, yeah, this is the Christmas episode which we will push out to the airwaves during the Christmas Eve in some countries. And all the rest of the world is just shit out of luck. <laughs> yeah, we both are not particularly religious in any sense uh, but regardless i do like the christmas time as something to spend time together with the family eat foods that i do like some do not some prefer not to hear anything about christmas for the simple reason that it has nothing to do with their culture but i will be completely savage and evil and wish you a Merry Christmas anyway, regardless of the backgrounds of Christmas and the holiday and the religion and it is what it is today and it is about getting together and and uh, spending a nice time. That's what it is for me. Yeah, Merry Christmas to all our listeners, wherever you may be. Exactly. And for the new listeners, If you haven't run off yet, The Flick Lab is the film podcast from the film buffs to film buffs. Every single week we will try to break down one movie to a particle level, sometimes atomic, and it takes like four hours. Our goal is here to have this as the leading go-to movie podcast. Hell, that's absolutely insane, but... um, Even if you're looking for lessons on morality and rationality, we seem to do that too. So tune in for anything at all. Basically, whatever actually might drive your imagination and whatever may be puzzling you, just tune in for this podcast to find the answers. Absolutely. We are from Finland, and this movie right here has just revitalized my interest levels for Japan. So thanks a lot, Henrik. I now have to travel to Japan. I am Kari. I have studied audiovisual communications, so I am an extremely amazing person, so bow to me, and I worked in media. My official title translates to media assistant, which sounds very low kind of a rank, but it depends on what kind of a work you get. But I'm not here to do a monologue about myself, so thankfully we will move on to roasting Henrik once again, as I like to do on this podcast. So, your name and rank, soldier? I'm sergeant in the heavy artillery regiment of Finland. Uh huh. Well, once again, you're overdoing it. Sergeant, no less. I'm a Jaeger. Meister. Yes, <laughs> Jaeger Meister. Well, when it comes to studies, while well, I finished the media studies about eight years ago, my co-host still keeps on studying his studies in the university level. His title, should he choose to accept it, after studying, what, four years? Uh, he would be the master of arts. Uh, but with great title comes great responsibility, Henrik. So, <clears throat> are you up for the challenge, Henrik? Uh, I heard that the next level from that is the master of the universe. 
well, already tried that job and, if I may say so myself, made a pretty damn good result. So, yeah, why not? Whatever suits you. I'm willing to get back on the job right after I finished my studies. <laughs> I, I have to give something to the plebs here, so. So much magnanimity in this podcast. Today's movie is very Christmassy, at least by the title. It is Merry Christmas, Mr. Lawrence. It's based on a book, The Seed and the Sower, by the South African writer Lawrence van der Post. Its first segment was written as a short story in 56 with the title A Bar of Shadow, and then later in 1963 he combined three interrelated stories into a full novel, and that is The Seed and the Sower, based on World War II on a camp in Java, Indonesia, one of those Japan enclaves. What's your history with this film, Henrik? Well, this is my second time of seeing this film. I first got the chance to see it when the Finnish Broadcasting Network Yle played it on TV. And that was about a year ago when that happened. And the film has always kind of stuck with me ever since. And now, since we are doing the Christmas Christmas episode for our podcast, and I most definitely felt that, that doing Die Hard for the Christmas episode was way too cliche and way too mainstream for our podcast, I immediately started to lo- lobby for us to cover this film uh, as, as our cr- Christmas feature. So you immediately thought that it would be the best to watch a movie that most of our listeners have not seen, which rings very true for the, to our Independence Day episode, in fact. Yeah, uh, actually, actually the thought process that went, to my, went through my mind when I was when I decided to actually recommend this movie to you as our Christmas film was that I remembered that David Bowie was or is in this movie. And well, David Bowie passed away yeah. a couple of years ago. So, you know, this being the Christmas, I decided that it would be, it would be kind of a fair from our, our end to remind all our listeners of David Bowie's, uh, Bowie's passing. And also, you know, to recommend our listeners a movie that has shit ton of violence and war crimes and torture in it. Because, you know, if, if not about that, then what is Christmas made of? Right on. And you, before I give my thoughts on the history, where you are you a David Bowie fan? I, uh, I'm a mid-tier David Bowie fan. I can also respect his artistic integrity, what I believe he is known for, and he does very artistic music with a lot of overlays that sometimes are not really speaking to me. He's indeed combining a lot of different things and trying to see how it works. Experimental music, in short. And some of it has worked for me, some not so much. The last album that he made... Uh, the, the the title song Dark Star was great. Not something to listen to every day, but I found it quite enjoyable. And when it comes to the movie, this was the first time that I have seen this. Could be even the first David Bowie movie, sorry to say, that I have seen. What I was happy about was to see that he's doing a really good job. He did actually also get some acting lessons and seems like a, he he's apart from Tom Conti he is like a the second pillar that is holding this film together yeah this was made during that time period when Bowie was trying to push himself into the film industry and kind of become a movie star on his own right that did not go through in the end as, as, you know, IMDb pages can show. But during that time period, he did make some pretty interesting films and interesting roles. 
Yeah, the director is Japanese, Nagisa Oshima. Also an interesting person. He was a stark defender of uncensored expression on film. He went as far as uh, has to criticize Akira Kurosawa for his humanism approach in his films. And Oshima's 1960s film was uh, Night and Fog in Japan. This was the first that gathered some controversy in Japan. It was in cinema circulation for one week until the production company withdrew the film from circulation, fearing political unrest, and this was happening after one political figure was assassinated. So Oshima then built his own independent production company, and the controversies continue. In the 1970s, he made a film called In the Realm of the Senses, and uh, this is a film based on true events of fatal sexual obsession in 1930s Japan. Oshima wanted the film to have real sex scenes, and therefore the film negatives had to be sent for processing and editing to France. In fact, the whole project was billed as a France production, so they left it be. So it was away from the watchful eye of more conservative Japan and their strict censorship. And even today, to this day, the uncensored version is not available in Japan. Which is funny, we are talking about Japan after all where everything is possible on screen. Yeah, Japan never has seen eye to eye with Oshima. As a, as a director, Oshima has always been a kind of a sticking point for the Japanese film industry due to the fact that most of Oshima's work and also his public presentations have been highly critical of Japan and especially Japan's past and the samurai mentality, which Japan carried with it for quite a long time. Like, Oshima is one of those directors who are not afraid to speak up against Japan. And that is something that has earned him quite a lot of trouble in Japanese film circles. I mean, Merry Christmas, Mr. Lawrence, the film we are now covering, also... It took Oshima four years to actually come up with the financing to make this film. And I would say that the troubles in the financing most likely stemmed from, from the political aspects, from Oshima's kind of a reputation as a critic of Japanese culture, and also for the fact that he had done the in the realm of senses six years before Mr. Lawrence. He's doing this movie around, still around the turn of the tide when Japan is, well, democratic and... Uh, but there are still these very old attitudes that are challenging the director. That it is, and also, well, when it comes to the samurai ideology, which is something that Japan kind of still likes to present to the outside world in their art. For example, there is a lot of samurai anime and samurai films are still made, which kind of showcase this, well, I, I can't anymore say glorified image of a samurai since, <clears throat> since the modern samurai films themselves also tend to be at least partly critical against the samurai institution. But yeah, Japan still likes to carry the, the spirit of the samurais with it. And, well, Oshima being as hard as he is in his films against Japan and Japan's history, I would say that would Oshima still direct today, he would still face issues and trouble stemming from the political circles. Mm, most likely. We are talking about a culture that is highly different to ours. And as we see it on the film, it makes the point that the conflicts appear whenever there are differences in culture. When we look at the cast, uh, just to mention that the director Nagisa Oshima died in 2013. When we look at the cast, Tom Conti is playing Mr. Lawrence. 
born in 41, a Scottish actor, a theater actor and novelist, conservatist. Conti is directly related to Napoleon Bonaparte from his father's side, and Conti apparently bursted out laughing when he heard these DNA results. He is married, has a daughter who is also an actress and ventriloquist. The marriage is an open marriage, so they can do whatever they please. Yeah, Tom Conti, he kind of was surprisingly, you know, after having his high peak in movies, kind of faded away into the background noise of the mainstream cinema. Like, if, if you watch the man's appearances in late movies, there is something like being a prisoner or one of the prisoners in Dark Knight Rises and roles like that. Which is pretty surprising when you contrast it to the fact that he has played in played roles like John Lawrence here. You would have thought that Tom Conti would have had more of a career in movies after films like this. You would think. Character actor in the sense that he has a certain persona, which was a delight to watch. Then there is Ruichi Sakamoto. First and foremost, he's a musician. He still does electronic music. His breakthrough was in 1978 with his band, which he co-founded, the Yellow Magic Orchestra. And I actually listened to his album from 2017. It's called Async. From the mellow opening track onwards, it was something very atmospheric and captivating. And I will definitely keep on listening to Sakamoto found it interesting. Well, I'm the kind of person who who is interested in experimental music, and I was hooked. And he did do the highly unconventional soundtrack of the film itself, and I enjoyed it. Yeah, I I most definitely, I, I loved the soundtrack. And I'm not hugely familiar with Sakamoto's other body of work, but what I have been able to listen to his other composings, I do like his style quite a lot. I haven't yet been able to listen to his latest album, but I do know that Finnish Broadcasting Network is going to play the actual concert, which he has performed. And that recording is hitting the TV airwaves later this year. Oh, really? So, yeah, so if you want to catch up with Sakamoto's work and, you know, actually see the concert recording of him playing the Async album, you should definitely check out Yle later this year. Okay, will do. So about the background of this film, you know, as mentioned, it's based on a novel and it's based on World War II events. The novelist himself was on a prison camp and uh, maybe you can... Tell about that because you read about it. Yeah, so doing my background checks for this film, I came up with kind of a two slightly differenting versions on how much this film is based on his book, The Seed and the Sour, which I myself unfortunately haven't read because it's kind of a pain in the ass to try to get your hands on it in Finland. But yeah, The Seed and the Sour is based on Wanderpost's own experiences as a POW during the Second World War, when, as the characters here, he also was imprisoned and held in Java. And Wanderpost had previously, before the war broke out, he had visited Japan, and he had to learn at least some Japanese during those times. So when he was imprisoned, he did know at least some Japanese. And because of this, the prison guards kind of a, took took a, a bit lighter approach to him. Like, as far as I've understood, the tensions were not friendly in any way. But, you know, to them, he was a person who at least could understand some Japanese. And, yeah, like the titular character here, Mr. Lawrence, Wanderpost also was tasked with the role of kind of a being the middleman between 
the guards and the other prisoners, and also tasked with keeping up the morale amongst the other POWs. And in this film it is depicted as such that the relations with this character Hara were particularly warm, and perhaps with even the other characters, or, well, we will get to that, but I will argue tonight that at the very least it's very interesting how it is possible to have a friendly relationship with the Japanese at the camp on that level when you speak everything out, let them know all the time what you actually think with, uh, while at the same time having this smile on your face. And uh, for people who may not be aware, during World War II, the Allied forces had cut off the oil from Japan to stop Japan's war in China. Japan had some planned action in the Southeast Asia to take control. And around the time of this planned action, this provoked finally the Pearl Harbor incident in Hawaii, which later was followed, of course, by USA dropping some nuclear bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki because Japan did not respond to the ultimatum that was given to them and the war unconditionally or get destroyed. There was not even confidence from the chief architect of the Pearl Harbor attack. It was this Isoroku Yamamoto, the chief architect of the attack on Pearl Harbor. He had some very strong misgivings about war with the United States. He stated roughly that he believed that Japan could keep this going maybe for six months or maybe up to a year, but after that, utterly no confidence at all. Yeah, the Pearl Harbor attack is kind of an interesting when you look at how it has later on been portrayed or how the, how the politics behind the attack has been portrayed in movies that have come out ever since. Because in most of the films, especially in those which come outside of America, it, it's usually shown that the Japanese chief of staff are being ordered to carry out the attack orders and the chiefs are actually highly suspicious and against kind of this taking this action against America. Most of the films, I would dare say all of them, always end up with these closing shots of the generals just, you know, being together and someone stating out that what the fuck did we just do? And it should be remembered that during the war, Japan was completely under control and under the mind bend and religious cult of the emperor, which was like a god for them. And this is why uh, the war was able to go on. So a lot of propaganda at, at that time. Afterwards, Japan has been portrayed as like in very evil way and in a racist sense not take anything away from the fact that they have uh, done some very violent deeds. But let's remember from where it's stemming from. Uh, yeah, then again, uh, some directors like, for example, Nakisha Oshima here also, or, well, Oshima has been extremely critical once again, for example, in this case of Japanese past and the samurai culture, Oshima himself has kind of made the case that it was the, the samurai culture and, and the idealization of Bushido, which eventually led into an emotional void within the Japanese people, which in fact then later on, kind of a fed into this misguided notion of honor. And that was one of the factors that played in, for example, the kamikaze attacks or the violent treatment of POWs in the prison camps or, for example, the massacre in Nanking. Not to glorify any kind of atrocities, but we could get into an endless conversation once again about how the Japanese work as kind of ants in the sense that there's no one who is um that they, they work for the greater good in that sense in a certain kind of rational 
way, but <laughs> of course there was probably a lot of good and a lot of bad in this religious sentiments to existence, from which I don't know if Japan has still gotten over with. Yeah, it's it's kind of a hard topic to really approach since, well, the most logical response would be, of course, saying that, well, they have gotten over it and they have moved past that point and those values. But then again, when you look at some of the popular culture images that Japan produces even today, you kind of still catch the notion of those values. So it, it's it's kind of like, have they gotten over it or have they not? Have they finally moved past on the idealization of, of the samurai culture and samurai values? Or are they still carrying them with them? Because it's kind of a it's it's kind of the situation where you logically would expect them to move past the values, but then you know a movie comes around or you catch up the latest anime and they are once again staring you right in the face. Maybe not as extreme mm. as before. Like I said, they have or I've gotten the notion that in popular culture they have been more critical towards those values and images now on the later stage. But they still haven't, or I would say they still are not denouncing them in their popular culture, in films and TV. Tokyo has westernized a lot, but I believe uh, if this is coming from the samurai culture, they have kept the politeness codes in their culture, at least in the business level, as far as I know in a very um, different way to our own, there's a lot of level codes. You treat someone or you speak to someone, you address someone in a certain way, depending on their rank. And from all I've heard, the work is still quite stressful in Japan. I find a lot of good in this as well. Japanese still know what is things like perhaps honor or just being like a civilized person, polite to one another and your elders, which we have lost almost entirely. That it is. It, it, it's a case of, you know, getting both the good and the bad at the same time. Yeah. As usual, cannot just draw a line here and say that you should entirely disengage from your past. Yeah. And also, it has to be noted that in today's world where we are all connected and global all the time, these things no longer exist in a vacuum in any way. So the Western idea of what is Japan and how the Japanese people are, well, I, I would say that it also affects Japan itself. So when we in the West constantly bring up, for example, Bushido and, and the samurai culture and, and being humble and hardworking and all that. Japan also is driven to play along with those images, which, which may help them to still keep a hold on and not completely moving past those ideas. But the sense of, or the projects of zealous conservation of your traditions and values. I see it really as a futile enterprise because, as you said, we are in contact with the whole world nowadays and the values will shift accordingly in any way they shift in good or bad and there is nothing you can do about it. I don't know. I, I would say that you can always either try to work for to ease up the process of forgetting those values or then push back against forgetting those values. I'm afraid that the big masses will just lead us into different values, let's say. Well, yeah, you know, could be, could be. Like you said, the current situation does not leave you with much hope for example, in preserving the old values. Yeah. But then again, you know, I'm a lover and a romantic at my heart. So, you know, I want to keep the hope still going. Today's drinks are water with a spice of lemon, at least for me. 
and three cups of coffee, which I have already finished. Today I'm taking it a little bit easier. Doctor's orders, let's say. And what about there? Okay, so you also went to the local booze store and saw yourself <laughs> how extremely hard and tricky it's get your hands on sake in Finland. <laughs> Is it though? If you go to the local sushi bar, you will find it straight away. Yeah, well, you know, I, I can't watch for our sushi bar in that sense. Like in Lapland, we have only one sushi bar and I don't know if they have sake. But I do know that our boosters do not stock up on that stuff. And I, I also haven't found any sake in Alko, in Tampere or in Turku, where I last checked the store shelves. And because of okay. that, I'm also sticking with water here on this episode, because that's something that David Bowie would really had needed at the end of this film. I had already seen you, like Tom Cruise in The Last Samurai, screaming on his knees for sake. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well... Apparently it was water. Your picture of me may still not be that far off. <laughs> When it comes to these cultural differences and the samurai talk that we have had, I could be a snobby bastard and read a passage from the book, which this is based on. Okay, I, for a moment I was sure that you are going to pick up the Bushido, the soul of Japan, and read a passage <laughs> from there. Yeah, this, uh, this is a description of Japanese people as viewed by the writer or the character in the book. Anyway... It goes like this. He had always felt, even when he was in Japan, that the Japanese were a people in a profound, inverse, reverse, or if I preferred it, even perverse sense, more in love with the death than the living. As a nation, they romanticized death and self-destruction as no other people. The romantic fulfillment of the national ideal, of the heroic thug of tradition, was often a noble and stylized self-destruction in a selfless cause. It was as if the individual at the start, at birth even, rejected the claims of his own individuality. Henceforth, he was inspired not by individual human precept and example so much as by his inborn sense of the behavior of the corpuscles in his own blood dying every split second in millions in defense of the corporate whole. As a result, they were socially not unlike a more complex extension of the great insect societies in life. In fact, in the days when he lived in Japan, much as he liked the people and country, his mind always returned involuntarily to this basic comparison. The just parallel was not an animal one, was not even the most tight and fanatical horde, but an insect one. Collectively, they were a sort of super society of bees with the emperor as a male queen bee at the center. End quote. And that is how I view the situation at hand. Yeah, that's how the film also views the situation. If going by, by Mr. Lawrence's own words. Who goes for the synopsis? You can check on it if you want. Okay, well... <clears throat> Well, it's a story about a prisoner of war and Colonel Lawrence attempt to keep the peace amidst cultural divide to avoid meaningless deaths. That's pretty much it. That pretty much is it. This is a movie about cultural clash and the clash of ideologies. There are kind of a four levels where this plays out. First one is the cultural class between the Western and, and the Japanese culture. There is also the clash between the ideologies of the Western prisoners and the Japanese prison guards. And then there are the bonds between the characters, most notably between John Lawrence and Gengo Hara, and later on with Sellers and Yonoi, who kind of a showcase two different sides of meeting the enemy with Lawrence and and Hara. It's once again, it's classing world views, which still end up in this mutual respect. 
And in Yonois and Sellier's case, it's a straight up power play spiced up with possibly a homosexual interest. So those are pretty much the themes, or at least my take on the themes going on behind this movie. The movie starts with Hara entering the tent of the prisoners of war, and the relationship between Hara and Lawrence is an interesting one, in the sense that it holds until the very end as peaceful and even very friendly, considering how he keeps up with these atrocities in the first frames of the film, Hara snaps and destroys, snaps out one of the eyes of the prisoners right there. There is the fact that he, Hara has to keep up some kind of an image at the camp as well, but I would see that he is a very brutal being compared to the overall impression that I got from Yonoi. I don't know, both of them in the end are quite brutal. Hara is the more blunt instrument when it comes to brutality. You know, he tries to be, he tries to present himself as the more soft and the more understanding version of the two. But at the same time, you know, he is ready to have Lawrence murdered simply out of principle and, well, simply to feel right about the situation. This being the case when they are arguing on how they should deal with the situation when they found the radio. Yeah. Yeah, from the medical bay. Which is an interesting one, because it's hardly surprising that Yonoi would seek for someone to take on the, the punishment, because that's what you do in the army, usually for the group, perhaps. But I think it is completely ordinary for someone to get the punishment at the end of day. <clears throat> well, they can't wipe out the entire camp, so somebody has to go. And that it is. But and th this is completely Western as well. That it he's is. completely surprised about it. Well, the, the problem really comes with Yonoi not even being interested in trying to find the real culprit and the guilty party. Instead, he just picks up Lawrence because it's convenient for him. Like, you know, okay. even kind of knows that the radio is not Lawrence's radio, but he's still kind of willing to let Lawrence take the punishment instead of finding the real guilty party, you know, simply because, well, someone has to be punished. And, you know, he's more interested in just giving out the punishment than actually doing the real detective work and trying to find out whose radio it is. This is probably partly because he just has to find someone and indeed he doesn't feel particular remorse and he doesn't know Lawrence so well. However, when they are discussing inside while the prayer is happening, I paid special attention to the voice of Yonoi and in his voice I could detect that he seemed to be genuinely surprised that it was not Lawrence who did that. Okay, well, yeah, that, that could be. I have to confess, I was not able to pick up the nuances in his voice that clearly. Yeah, okay, and he's speaking in Japanese, right? So, yeah. kind of a hard to pick it out, maybe. But what is this movie really about? As you said, there's a lot of this, these themes around you. There is, for one, this could even be seen as a gay romance. Film. But it is. It, it, it is a gay romance between two rock stars. Yeah, there is this affectionate slow music played during the court hearing, and the camera slowly pans towards Captain Yonoi. And then again, during the hearing, he stares perhaps a second too long at Sellier's body when he takes off his shirt to reveal the scars from beating. Or he was just surprised that he is without a shirt. I don't think so, because they were okay with him removing the shirt in the first place. And at the end of the film, he of course gets kissed on the cheeks by Sellers. This is of course just to take away his honor and prevent the killing. Uh, but later, when given the chance, Yono does not hurt uh, Sellers. He only takes a piece of his hair 
to take yeah. it to, to his to his village. In fact, yeah, you are you are right on those, and there is also that moment when the dialogue very clearly brings up the case of homosexuality and how the Japanese are not afraid of homosexuality. It was Haras and Mr. Lawrence's dialogue exchange, but yeah, there are all those loving glances. There is that taking the locket off as a memento and, you know, you combine all that with an actual dialogue exchange covering homosexuality and is it natural to be afraid of homosexuality? So, yeah, my take also is that this is very much a homosexual love story. And then again, we, I'm coming outside of the Japanese culture, obviously. And there is also the strong theme of different culture. And also, Yono has a huge respect for Sellers because he also appears to be completely selfless and is ready to sacrifice himself for the I think greater good in his view. Yeah, in in many ways Sellers is close to the Japanese in in a physical sense. Lawrence here is is someone who who has a deep understanding of Japanese culture and can really talk to the Japanese prison guards. Even though he still see that that the way Japanese act and and that Japanese values are somewhat faulty and should not be hold. But Saliers instead is well he's a fighter. Saliers is someone who never walks away from the fight to a point where it has actually manifests in his nickname. And that, on the other hand, is something that is extremely valued by the Japanese. They talk about how how you should fight to the end and harasses the prisoners as cowards because they have allowed themselves to be caught and they do not make resistance. And basically the entire Japanese military has taken the, the stance that you should fight to the end. And uh, Serrier is the prisoner who constantly fights. And as the things escalate, he is the man who fights to the bitter end and faces death knowingly without begging mercy at the end and accepts it. And in this way, in a physical sense, Selyers is extremely close to the Japanese and the cultural values that the Japanese carry here in this film. I should add to my previous statements just that that this kind of a kamikaze approach may run counter to a logical perspective. It really boils down to, at that point, what is more valuable or, the, the, yeah, this is getting more like philosophical. There perhaps is no right answer to that. Is it worth it to kill yourself for the greater good? Or is it good to almost kill yourself, but not quite? Yeah, well, well, why not carry over the theme? Because it's a good question. And it's a question that even this movie does not completely find a way to give a 100% answer. Because sure, here... Both Yonoi and Seriers kind of find that fighting is easier than just to live. And in a way, I myself feel that sacrificing yourself, going out, fighting, might be, you know, the correct course of action to take, depending on the circumstances and depending on what's at stake. But at the same time, you know, as this film portrays Yonoi and Seliers as fighters and as persons who are accepting the concept of death almost day-to-day basis, it also kind of shows them in a light where they use the fighting as a way to hide and forget kind of their own past. Like Seliers who never surrender, uh, truly surrenders to the Japanese prison guards and who accepts death twice in the course of the movie 
he's at the same time he's a man who is extremely deeply driven by his own mistakes in his childhood and what he did to his little brother like that shame is something that he carries with him constantly and i would say that the film here that is something that affects salier's readiness to die salier is ready to die because he wants resolution and he wants somehow to be punished and through the punishment find forgiveness to what he did to his brother and and at the same time salier is so relentless and so ready to fight against the japanese prison guards and go against anything that is demanded of him because through that act of fighting and the act of resistance he can hide and at times forget the guilt that he carries this guilt for david bowie in his acting performance might stem from his real life scenario where actually his younger brother was diagnosed as having some kind of mental problems he was mentally ill and was sent to an institution and the story in the movie is reflecting on david bowie's own experience uh, it was either before or after this movie that his brother committed suicide yeah well you know didn't know that and i i have to say that Hearing that, I really have to give it out to David Bowie for yeah. kind of having the strength and the backbone to take something so painful to yourself and use it to channel your performance here on the film. The film shifts from the beginning brutal scenes of the first act, or rather the first five minutes, to a less brutal tone. So the brutality is there more to set up the homosexual theme and to give a bang of a start but from that moment onwards it might not be what some might expect it to be yeah. like a more of a more brutal survival story it's more about the relations of these people that it is like in the end in the film the conflict does not go away gets resolved okay yeah I... it gets resolved outside of the camera and the survival from the camps happens outside of camera yeah exactly and that's why i would argue that the resolution is kind of not solved in the sense that this movie spends almost the entirety of its runtime in this camp and the resolutions are not to be found there as you said it's found off the camera which is saying that there is no there is no regular linear story goal or sense of story here there is no proper beginning and end to their stories when looked at from the camp environment perspective but sure in the end we see how hara will face the execution and some get out of the camp but that is outside of the core of the film and that takes place at the camp and that it is this is a film about studying ideologies and this is a film about the characters yeah through and through yeah this is not the great escape no where where the focus of the film is on the physical task of escaping the prison camp yeah it's about development of the characters and and their relationships with people but ultimately it's about just the experiences at the camp as far as i can interpret this so no big resolution no big goal in that sense story-wise no the resolution you get is it's more personal one it's it's in what happens to Selyers and what happens to Yonoi and what happens to Hara and Mr. Lawrence that's where you find your resolutions yeah and perhaps this rather documentary like approach is both the strength and the weakness of the film yeah to me it was definitely a strength but yeah like we both have pointed out if you would have wanted more kind of a physical resolution to the proceedings or if, if you would have liked to see 
a film where there is a linear story that flows through with the prison camp theme, uh, showcasing, ending with you seeing, do they escape the camp or do they get out? How do they get out? You know, if, if you want that kind of a movie experience, in that case, this is completely wrong movie to you. Yeah, no, it's you are just as a viewer sometimes trying to grasp what is the main focus of this film. And the focus never comes in the traditional movie making sense, perhaps, or it's there, the, the resolution is there, but it's not so obvious. Yeah, that's that's something that I really love in this film. But at the same time, it, it's also something that makes this one uh, maybe a little bit more harder to recommend to your friends than, for example, Great Escape. Yeah. What's your take on uh, Cellier's playing a loon in the cell? Because it's rather interesting. I think it really serves no other purpose other than he trying to remember the best parts about being alive. But the first thought was he's trying to put on an act to get out of this gloomy situation. But uh, of course, later the character develops. Well, already in the during the execution, to a point where you can say that he's not trying to save himself. Yeah, the, my first take on the scene was also that he's trying to pretend to be alone in order to somehow save himself. But uh, the more I think about that scene, I kind of get the notion that it was Cellier kind of giving himself the last rights on that moment when he was he was certain that that this is going to be that he's going to be shot at this moment and well to me it kind of in the end it kind of played a little bit similar to the situation for example the american death row where during the final final day you get a meal that you have asked for and it's, it's a better one that you usually get you get the last Conforts before, you know, facing the electric chair. That's a good take. Yeah. And in, well, in Salier's case, the Japanese were most definitely not going to give him any of those things. So Salier has this moment of make believe where he himself gives himself a shave and a good food and a cup of tea. As mentioned before, Sergeant Hara and John Lawrence, their relationship has to be exceptionally warm. Is That's my reading. Because constantly throughout the movie, Lawrence is being open about his feelings to him, throwing lines such as, don't be stupid, and keeps on smiling his confident smile. Considering that, he gets off quite easily from this situation. He gets beaten up a few times, but everybody seems to like him. Yeah, everybody else except group captain Hicksley, who really has it in for Lawrence. And who is the member from the Allied side who Lawrence classes most with for his attitudes towards the Japanese? Yeah, there always have to be one thick-headed individual, perhaps arguably for a reason in some of the... when the Yono is asking for the details of some personnel, but th this character totally misses the point. He doesn't understand how valuable Lawrence is for keeping the peace and saving lives. That it is. But to give Hicksley some leeway here, it's a tough situation. And not seeing Lawrence's importance and value on those surroundings, well, I don't know, maybe it's an easy mistake to make. And from this we get to situation where we hear the word strafer. I could not right off the bat find the translation to the word strafer, but I can find a translation for the word strafe, which means to have sexual intercourse. So this is based totally on urban dictionary, so must be a valuable source. But is Jack Selliers really the Jack sex master Selliers? Come food for your thought. Yeah, well... This gets kind of interesting. I myself also, I don't know, but I'm going yep. 
myself, I'm going off with the Finnish release of the movie, which comes courtesy to Future Films. And because it's a Future Films feature, it also means that the production qualities of the DVD are somewhat low, and that may also affect the translation, which my copy had on the or the subtitles, but in my version, it was subtitled as Rökittäjä, which translates extremely badly to English. I, I don't have a word for Rökittäjä in English, but basically a guy who... Mugger, <laughs> almost. A, a, a mugger, maybe. A guy who who kicks a lot of ass. And this is where my take on Selier's character... And, and his reputation of being a fighter really stems from because when I met the notion that his fighting spirit has become his, he's so well known for his need and drive for fighting that it has become his nickname. Well, Rökittäjä is what I was referencing at that point. He does explain it to Jono in the sense, or he does say that he is. He's a uh, soldier, 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 yeah. soldier. soldier. That, that he, he does, but you know, if, even he can really explain what the fuck is Rökittäjä here in my version of the film. Oxford a Dictionary. Straffer, a person who or thing which attacks someone or something. Specifically a low-flying aircraft which attacks repeatedly with bombs or machine gun fire origin early 20th century well since i am within the confines of my limited vocabulary i will just make it simple in layman terms for everyone and say that he is jack badass selliers that he is throw and throw out there is the flower incident which triggers locating the radio yeah the moment when they break the gear or how do you pr- yep. pronounce it? But Kyo. Yeah, the form said fast. Which they do not care about. Yeah, I can clearly see why I wouldn't care about that myself either in that situation or, well, in any situation for that matter, like 48 hours without any food or water. At that point, Jono has confessed to Lawrence that he was one of the group of individuals who, if I understood it correctly, was he was part of the 1926 coup d'etat attempt to get control of the military forces. Attempted coup was organized by a group of young imperial Japanese army officers with the goal of purging the government and military leadership of their factional rivals and ideological opponents. This is from Wikipedia. The Japanese soldier who is accused of having some homosexual going-ons at the camp, has survived his previous self-stabbing, attempted suicide. Now he finally succeeds with it. And from the ranks of the prisoners, the so-mentioned victim cries no when he's about to be killed by himself and also Hara. So something might have been going on right there on a yeah, my take romantic was that, level. My take was that they were simply deeply opposed on this extremely strict discipline and handing out death penalties left and right. Like, like the whole allied group opposes on being there. The Dutch soldier still mentions that he was taking care of his wound for a long time and then suddenly he did something which was not to his liking i suppose yeah Ahara talks about the incident as a ray but then again that could also just be Hara's interpretation of what has happened it's hard to say since we don't actually see here the incident itself and the incident is never completely talked through in a sense that would explain it to you clearly what has happened it sounds like a shaming attempt yeah it could also be that dude at least does get 
shamed a lot at the beginning of the film when Bohara uh, is, I don't know if it counts uh, interrogation or anything like that. But, you know, w- once they have already prisoned the guard and when the concept of Harakiri is first brought up, Hara is actually constantly shaming the guy right there and then. There is one soldier who sees that he's been put in a situation of shame after Celiers has provided the food with the mask of flowers into their camp. And therefore he, well, actually goes into the lengths of killing he, one of his own guard that is guarding him to get access to the cell and to try to an attempt to kill Celiers. But uh, then again, he is talking about evil spirits in that person, and this is why he has done this. Okay, so so maybe not attempt to get back your honor. Yeah, what I took it was that he was trying to protect Yono's honor and kind of uh, prevent Celiers from corrupting Yono's spirit or soul so what he was trying to do was protect the yonoi soldier kills himself lawrence comes to assist celliers hara is in the scene arguing with yonoi chaos chaos from which we turn into the scene where hara is doing the holy deed and yonoi and lawrence are having their discussion about how to you know it is not his concern who brought the radio inside the camp. He needs somebody to be punished. Henrik, is this movie pro-Japanese or pro-anything? I would say that this most definitely is not pro-Japanese or, or not directly. Like This is extremely hard on Japan, but... At, at the same time, you know, this is like if the film would have been made by a Westerner, I could immediately go out and say that this is not pro Japanese. I even think if this is anti Japanese movie, but this has been done by a Japanese director. And in that sense, I, I would kind of argue that this is one of those tough love movies where the director is extremely critical and judges Japan very harshly, but does it out of love. Mm, That's well put. In one sense, yeah, it looks like it's very critical towards the Japanese and kind of, uh, suppose, ignoring the Geneva agreements. And it's hard to say if it's letting the British too easily in this movie, because they are, in fact, the prisoners. So, with the limited capability for terrorizing. That is, um, you know, if if I would have to point out, like, one thing that this movie would be trying to be, I guess that would be, it would be an attempt to charge Japan's love for Hakagure and Bushido, both warrior ideologies that, kind of embrace uh, extinguishing your feelings and not showing emotion. Bushido is notable for stating that if samurai's stomach is empty, it's, it's a disgrace to feel hungry. Hagakure, which also is a military philosophy from the 1600s, states that a soldier must always follow Bushido to a point where in a situation where a soldier has a choice between life and death, the soldier should always pick death. And, you know, with these kind of ideologies, you kind of end up in a situation where, where expressing kindness, expressing love, expressing basically any emotion except aggression becomes demonized. You you can't do that. It, it would be against Bushido. It would be against Hagagure. You can't express fear because you have to always accept death. You can't express hunger because that would be a disgrace. And well, that kind of leads you into a situation where if the only emotion 
you are allowed to express his cruelness or his aggression, then that makes, or the film says that it would make you extremely cruel as a person. And Japan's history with Bushido and Hakakure would be something that that here have made Japan and Japanese cruel and violent people. And the film demands that Japan w- should move past these ideologies and allow itself to more freely express their feelings, express fear, express hunger, express all these things. Because that is the only way how you can be emotionally whole as a person. And this way kind of find inner peace and not be as cruel and violent as the prison guards are being here on Merry Christmas, Mr. Lawrence. So let's say it's about being anti these ideologies and not so much against uh, any nation as such. No, yeah, that, that's my take because... Oshima himself, he has always seen the deep love for Bushido and these ideologies was something that actually ruined his country, which ruined Japan. Like, that is the mentality behind the kamikaze attack. That's the mentality behind attacking against the USA and getting caught up with the whole Second World War. That was the mentality behind the Nanking Massacre. And Oshima himself has stated that it was only after the Second World War, when it was learned in Japan that you can also live for your country and not just die for it. Hmm, interesting. In this flashback where Celiers saves his little brother once, and then not again when the lunch of his school is... Putting him inside the pool, he is not helping him anymore. I couldn't find quite the point here. Is it just Celiers' way of making him a man? or? But in any way, he makes a big miscalculation here. And afterwards, he feels a lot of pain for this inaction and his little brother never sings again. Yeah, to me, that was kind of the moment that brought Celiers as a character closer to the Japanese characters. Because, yeah, in the flashbacks, Celiers is also driven kind of this need to face the conflict. In the first flashback, he knows that, that the bullies are there to meet them. And Celiers still walks that road with his little brother. He tells his little brother not to run, but or just go straight home. He's disappointed on his little brother for the fact that the little brother instead ran back to the church and got the priest come running and intervene with the situation. Right. But it's also something that shows Celier's vanity because on the, on that later flashback, Celier makes the point that he did not come for his little brother when the brother was yelling, or before that, when his little brother was waiting for him outside of the classrooms. Celier did not go to his little brother because he did not want to be seen with his little brother, who he took as a weak person. Yeah, so there's also that vanity. Celier wanting to have this perfect image that can't be tarnished by publicly pulling favors for your little brother, showing up with your little brother when the brother is in distress. After Celiers has shamed Yonoi with the kisses on the cheek, we see Celiers on the ground with only his head above the ground. He's completely under the sand. And the last piece of flashbacks is when... His brother is actually giving him the acquittal or it's just a flashback to the earlier moments as he already said that he never sang again and in the last flashback he sings so it's just remembering the best moments, the good moments, I suppose. Yeah, I took it that as as the moment 
when Celia Austin dies. And that would be kind of the moment when, mm. well, not getting to heaven, but getting this inner peace with yourself. That is the moment when Celia forgives himself for what he did to his little brother all those years ago. And finally, is willing to let go of the guilt that he has been carried all these years. Henrik, do you know Father Christmas? Looks like Hara at least doesn't. Well... So he's letting Lawrence off the leash of a sentence? Is that it? Yeah, that it is. You know, would still have kept Lawrence imprisoned and waiting, I don't know, maybe yeah. even death penalty. Or at least, you know, kept him imprisoned. But Hara being shit-faced drunk and being the father Christmas for everyone lets the two finally out. And somebody else has to suffer the consequences. Yes, and Hara informs that he has executed the radio soldier. Yeah, that was, once again, the Chinese POW who Hara claims is the one who had brought in the radio to the camp. It's it's never shown. The whole character is never shown. So you never actually are fully certain if Hara is actually telling the truth, if he let Lawrence out simply because, you know, he had found the real culprit or if Hara is just lying to his teeth here. Yeah. After the assumed Sellier's death scene, we get to the final scene where Mr. Lawrence visits the cell of Hara in, uh, is it in Indonesia or? It's really hard to say where Hara is being kept. Definitely British overseas territories of the time where they keep Hara and they share compliments and remember the good old times of the Merry Christmas Mr. Lawrence dialogue and Mr. Lawrence is grateful for that. And Hara is grateful that Mr. Lawrence would get Mr. Hara out of there to his family if he just could. But somebody has to paint it as the fall guy here once again. Yeah, the nation has to save face some way. Yeah, usually if you're in a commanding position, you can kind of expect that. Yeah, losing a war is always kind of a risky move in this sense. Yeah, this is how the credits roll on... Merry Christmas, Mr. Lawrence. Separate sections of interest. This film was filmed in Cook Islands, in Rarotonga. Uh, this is for the prisoner camp scenes in Java. So we're still in Indonesia. Then something has been filmed in New Zealand, the college scenes. So it's uh, relatively close to Indonesia. So... Uh, and then there's Hara's Prison, also filmed in Auckland. As well of the view of the railway station. What was the railway station name? It was Pillows. <laughs> Funny. This film is beautifully shot. Picture is always set very in a traditional and a very, very golden cutish way in most of these scenes. Perhaps nothing special, but the shooting is well done and the lighting is clean and clear and... It's nice to look at. It helps that it was uh, filmed in a beautiful uh, island as well. Okay, there is also those two kind of a glitchy speed-up moments where for a few frames the movie kind of a speeds up and it, it kind of a jumps from a frame to frame in a way that the movement kind of looks glitchy. These moments being when Celieres is first enters the camp and starts walking towards Lawrence and later on when Celieres kisses Yonoi. Hollywood had still not learned from the good old days of rear window and superhuman walking speed. Well, yeah, well, once again, it's not nearly as bad as rear window, but you know, your golden eyes... You can get a little bit bleeding from those two scenes. When it comes to glitches, there is a fix done in post-production, and I don't know if you picked it up, but you can pick it up so easily. And 
Do you know what I'm talking about? The overdubbing moment of this movie? No, I did not pick that one up. When Celiers is in the hearing, he says to Captain Yonoi that, You know, I came to Java in August. You know, the commander in Java was captured in March. But in the film, he does not say March. He says, I believe, June, judging from the mouth movements. Okay. Yeah, that's something that I, on the other hand, can't pick up. There you go for all the fans of glitches. You can look it up now. Yeah, th thanks for this one. <laughs> you know, her, we, we, 10 points and gold star for Golden Eyes once again. Yeah, huh? Golden Eye. As mentioned, we did love, or we did like the soundtrack. You would expect something more melodramatic, something with a thunderous orchestra, which we do not get. And no problem with that. No, I, I think it works. It, it works extremely well. It, it works so well, actually, that I myself have the soundtrack. Okay. The title theme is very catchy as well. And that it is. And, well, the... Maybe I should play it during, you know, Christmas Eve now. Maybe you should play it after the closing words of this episode, just so that we can <laughs> once again get into problems with the copyrights and exactly. get, get ourselves yeah. flagged out of YouTube. You know, I have been super careful with the copyrights in this podcast because the, the law changes really country by country. Yeah, there are some international agreements perhaps, and but really, for example, giving the profile graphic for separate episodes. I do not want to use the official graphics from the movies, because then to have it show up in quality in all kinds of millions of billions of different devices that people use nowadays, it would have to be high-level HD. And I'm not going to use the high-level poster art of Mr. Roller Lawrence in this episode, so I'm sorry about that, but hell of a lot easier this way. And when it comes to the theme tune, well, thanks a lot, Henrik. Now I will have to do some doodling of my own, maybe do a cover version. Feel free. <laughs> or not, if it's terrible. You, you Which can, it undoubtedly will be. You can, you know, so, something that you can, o o of course, always do is to make the remake of the only song with vocals from the entire soundtrack. So, you know, you, you can start popping for forbidden colors and, and sing the entire song yourself. <laughs> and I, I guess after that, it would fall under fair use because you would only be using the music and all the vocals would be sung by you. So it would be a <laughs> cover. You really want that, huh? Well, <laughs> you know, it, it, it might be a good Christmas present for all our listeners. What's next? The flick lap rap tune with vocals by me. God damn, now that you mentioned it. <laughs> In a technical sense, for all the extreme nerds out there, this movie's aspect ratio is 1.85, which is in no way interesting for anybody. A camera is Panaflex camera, lenses by Panavision, laboratory was still in Tokyo. Uh, so this time the film was not moved all the way to France to be processed. Granted, there is not nudity here in this movie, and certainly not in this podcast. Yeah. Totally void of such for now. Yeah, it's, it's, film... a, it's only a matter of six-pack <laughs> and HD cameras. Negative format 35 millimeter and blah, blah, blah. I tried to find proper business statistics for this movie, and I failed, and now I must commit harakiri. Anyway, before I do that, opening weekend in USA was $99,000 at that time's course, exchange rate, and total USA, 2,300,000, which sounds low. It does, it does. And... Going by the Wikipedia page, the overall US box office was not that great. Yeah. Budget, I do not know. Yeah. Well, once again... Go I, would, I would say a couple of a million. 
It's not a... It's... Yeah, they are on an island in the middle of nowhere with a group of Japanese and UK individuals doing a war movie. And with most expensive actors, most likely being David Bowie and Takeshi Kitano. Yeah. Them being the two biggest names in, in this film. First act, second act, third act. Any special mentions about those? Was it flowing well for you? I think that the pacing is extremely good in this film. I agree. I was hooked. I was too. There was no moment when I was checking my watch, seeing how how long is this still going to take. And it flowed very naturally and very nicely, and it, it had this kind of energetic take from one scene to the next. We will reserve the watching of watch. Not exclusively, but absolutely including Hellraiser Bloodline. Bloodline is an interesting piece. <laughs> uh, there, there is... I remember that you were a big fan. Isn't it the one where they're in space? It's precisely that one. <laughs> like, like there are things that happened to Hellraiser franchise after part two, and not all of them in any way nice things. I still like the Hellraiser 3 to a point. I mean, come on. Um, there's a baddie who throws compact discs at you. Uh, yeah, that was lame. Uh, also, also the <laughs> baddie who, who kills the one guy with a camera zoom lens that has been implanted in his eye. Like That was a thing in Hellraiser 3 and throwing the entire philosophy behind Hellraiser and behind the Cenobites out of the window and just going with, oh yeah, well, Pinhead is a demon and is evil now, rules mentality. But yeah, Bloodline, had it not been once again Miramax Films and goddamn Harvey Weinstein with his <laughs> editing antics. We definitely could make some valuable episodes out of Hellraiser once, because you know your way around those ones and maybe we can do something fun with Nightmare on Elm Street as well. I think we both do like that series. Uh, at least some entries. Do you carry at all remember the last time when we actually tackled an entire franchise here on this podcast? Just asking because that was not that long time ago. <laughs> this is the exact point where you have to tell me to stop as I asked you to do. But no, I think it would be sensical to do some series, but in the sense that we do not do them fully, you know, back to back, that we can watch some other movies in between and then get back to the next chapter. And uh, that could be uh, also not making them with as tight schedule as we did the Halloween franchise. Because, no, no. yeah, because, because with Halloween, there was also the point that we were actually fighting against the release schedule of the latest entry. Yeah, trying to milk everything uh, of, of its worth <laughs> of the cinema release of the Halloween 2018. Yeah, at, at this point, we can finally give up all the pretense that it was any kind of artistic endeavor and <laughs> just plain out admit that we were just trying to milk the release date and the hype of the latest <laughs> entry. But that is also fun. You know, if you do not do anything about this, and if I do not commit harakiri after this episode, uh, there's also the Pippi Longstocking episode, 50th anniversary <laughs> uh, episode I'm, chance. I'm not touching Pippi Longstock. Come on, it's the 50th. And we haven't done a Swedish episode. No, no, you are de definitely not going with Pippi Longstock. Come on, Heisula, Heisula, Hopsansa. God damn, you know, that, that's, that's, that's an entire jailbait just waiting to happen. And I'm not going anywhere near that shit. Well, there is also Emil. You know, this is the point that I'm telling you to stop. <laughs> we will talk about this. <laughs> On a, a dim street uh, after this episode. I, I'm holding my breath open. Oh, okay. What, what's your favorite performance if we get back from Spaceship Hellraiser? 
it's extremely hard to say because I love all the four mains in this film. Like, great performances all around. All the characters are so different that it's, it's hard to pinpoint one. But, you know, this is the choosing pool. So, maybe David Bowie in the end. If, if, yeah. if, if I really absolutely have to pick just one performance, maybe David Bowie. But I most definitely do love all of the main characters. Maybe David Bowie. Maybe Ruichi Sakamoto as well. And if he titles himself mainly as a musician, then um, sounds like a good job. Would you improve anything in the film? Uh, in a way, I I would be tempted try to have even more scenes with the philosophies going on and with them talking about the mentality of war. But at the same time, I'm extremely afraid of touching this film in any way because it's such a great movie so no i would not tamper with this film i have a small temptation to give it a shot and try to somehow change this movie but at the same time i'm fairly certain that i would just fuck up the process so no i'm i'm leaving the movie as it is my scissors of sacrilege will not be cutting any frame out of this movie. I didn't feel any need for that. What is your favorite end of life scene? I guess it would be the, and this once again is a hard pick, but the moment when the prison guard accused of rape commits harakiri. Yeah, have to agree. <laughs> okay. The most effective scene with something like that. Yeah. With some with death. I would have guessed, or my money was on you picking the David Bowie death scene. Okay, well, no, because it's also kind of open-ended at the moment, but isn't it explained in the final scene that he died? What's your favorite scene? Uh, well, why don't you go first, and I quickly try to point out. My favorite scene is when Lawrence and Hara are talking inside what looks to be a hut around, is it like the 20-ish minute mark? And Hara is asking to ask from his colleague if he is a homosexual or not, and he says no. Just this interaction during this whole scene is nice, and it's well shot. It's in enjoyable framing. Yeah, I, on the other hand, I'm tempted to go with the philosophies that are going on with the scene in my pick and yeah that's uh you had a really good pick in that sense since the dialogue exchange concerning the attitude towards homosexuality is really good stuff yeah just to say that not that particular dialogue in that scene but the scene itself in as a whole but yeah yep but my point was that you know in my pick for the favorite scene, it's it's going to be what they are talking about. And since you already choose the hot scene, I guess I will go with Hara and Lawrence at night in the Med Bay, where they yeah. talk about Cellier and more importantly, talk about the different points of view, how, how the Westerners see shame and their situation as POWs versus how Hara sees them, where Hara sees the POWs as cowards and is asking how you can guys can live with the shame of being taken prisoner. And Lawrence explains to him that he does not see as a shame that what he's waiting for is that moment when they can get out and continue fighting. Yeah, okay. Also a memorable scene. Yeah. Really hard to pick that between that one and the scene with Seriers kissing Yonoi. When it comes to the quotes, I have some that made me chuckle or found them interesting. From the same scene that I mentioned as my favorite scene, it ends with Hara saying, when he's informed that another Englishman has arrived at the camp, he says quickly, 
in this very militaristic uh, speech. Another queers here. <laughs> <laughs> then during the fake execution of David Bowie, well, he's basically David Bowie. <laughs> I'm going to say David Bowie. He says, I don't need any help. I've practiced walking for years. It's a good character quote. It is. I mean, it really kind of shows Sadier's toughness. Also, in a moment where he is certain that this is it, and he still kind of uh, has this fighting attitude. Yeah, and even before he enters the house where the execution is supposed to take place, uh, there's this officer who asks, can you guess what I'm thinking? And he's laughing. <laughs> As Elier says, yes, I think so. Can you? Yeah. And then this face of shock and surprise, then getting beaten. My choices would be from the hot scene, the quote was create friendships among men mm. and vice versa from the very end of the film, the final quote, Merry Christmas, Mr. Lawrence, Merry Christmas. <laughs> That's a good one. Maybe also Lawrence's lines to Hara at his jail cell when Hara is asking why he has to face the death penalty when he has not done anything that any other Japanese soldier has done. And Lawrence remarks that Hara is, is a victim of the men who now think that they are right. And mm. in, in the same way that Hara and Yonoi once thought that they were right or they were absolutely right and remarks that the truth is that no one is right here. Indeed. And uh, Henrik, what's your favorite flavor of hamburger? Bacon. Okay. Now that I have successfully switched your complete thinking scape into something else, now with a fresh start, what is the first frame that you think of this movie? It would be, once again, very end of the film. It's, it's the part when Sirius has been buried in the sand and Yonoi comes to him during the night time and very end of that scene, Yonoi makes the military salute to Sirius. And, you know, that's my image. For me, it's the inside the first five minutes when a man is about to kill himself. When the movie starts with a bang, I think that's what I can recall the fastest. Yeah, it really does set up the tone for this film. And it's kind of an eye-opening scene. You are only five minutes into this movie and already quite shocking violence is being shown to you. So you really know that this is going to be a rough ride. I wouldn't say that this is like the... I have a category of the most ridiculous scene whenever needed. But no, there's nothing r ridiculous per se. There's something that is quite funny. And I don't mean to be rude on this podcast, never. Or disrespectful. But <laughs> dur during the uh, so-called court hearing, the interrogator says, how do you plead? But with that accent, it definitely sounds like how, how do you breed? <laughs> Something where the right answer definitely is not guilty. I, w I would vouch that this actor did not speak a word of English. Mm, yeah, I could actually, you know, take your notion on that one. Because without the subtitles, I would have been quite lost. Who goes first? Would we, would you recommend Merry Christmas, Mr. Lawrence? I most definitely do recommend Merry Christmas, Mr. Lawrence. I, it's, it's a great film. It's a movie that, in my opinion, has very much to say. And, well, Christmas is a time when we usually watch The Fucking Death, the movie It's a Wonderful Life from the fucking four. Grinch. From the fucking 40s, where the movie revolves around the concept of man contemplating on, you know, committing suicide. And basically the entire film just being the man not 
in the end committing the suicide because the intervening angel. So in that sense, I think Merry Christmas, Mr. Lores is much more better Christmas film because here you can actually see a bunch of guys trying to commit the suicide and actually succeeding and going through with it. So this much more fulfilling film experience than It's a Wonderful Life. In that no- notion, mm-hmm. I would also recommend committing war crimes. Because they are always funny as fuck. <laughs> yeah, I would also recommend Merry Christmas, Mr. Lawrence. Highlights, very, very stable, very enjoyable cinematography, very good performances, solid pace, a plot that is always good to remember. The sense that the war is rarely anything personal and there is friendship to be found around conflict, as mentioned. But I didn't find any like particular point to follow here, and even the character of Selliers is in the posters and in the trailers and everywhere, made as the leading character of this film. And yeah, I do not see that. It's For me, it's Lawrence, and definitely it's, it's also in the title. Maybe this was made only as a point to market the film because, hey, it's David Bowie. But it didn't really matter that it didn't have a, like a certain central focus apart from the ideas of the cultural differences and finding fellowship nevertheless in the midst of stress. Well, this has been fun. Thank you, Henrik, for the movie. It was an enjoyable experience. You're very welcome. The Flick Lab can be found online. On Facebook we will keep you up to date with what the next episode always will be. And we'll post all the links to different places where you can find our episodes. You can do the same on Twitter if you prefer that medium. You can also find the episodes on YouTube. And you can find some meaningless nonsense on Instagram whenever available. Yeah, just just remember that this movie states... Wars create friendships among men, and podcasts create wars among men. <laughs> so, you know, stay tuned. <laughs> Just waiting for the next yelling match. Yeah, the next episode is six degrees of celebration called Yolki in its native country, Russia. Are we going to fight there, or are we going to fight about Mr. Lawrence on the back alleys? Or is it Pippi Longstrump? Well, you know, you know we, we can... You, you can have an official poll on the chosen fight material, and then we can have a bunch of people coming together in one dark alley, and we can have an all-around battle royale centered around all, all the three movies you just named. I think we could have a nice fighting match about a certain some movie. And that is Mission Impossible 2. Holy shit. <laughs> Opening a whole can of worms there. Stay tuned on that. Maybe it's good to do during the summer. It's a summer blockbuster, (laughs) which I went to see in the movies as a teenager and quite enjoyed it. There's definitely something deeply wrong with you, man. (laughs) We will get to that. Thanks, Henrik. was great. And Merry Kurizumazu, Henrikusan. Merry Christmas to you also as well as from us, from this laboratory, to our listeners. Yeah, to all our, I don't know, do I hazard to guess at this point, a total of five listeners? (laughs) I think it's been a very meditative episode. We really tried to get to the bottom of the deeper nuances here. At least we tried, you know, our success is once again under the evaluation of our listeners. Hopefully also after hearing this, also checking out the film themselves. Yeah, all right. Pleasure as always, and hope to get back to you after this particular celebration time. And take it easy, relax, eat some good food, and then come back to us for the New Year's episode. I've been Karri, you have been, I think, still Henrik, and see you in the next one. Yep. See ya.